Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the beautiful day you have given. Uh, we do pray, Father, for Easter coming up. We pray for awesome weather on that day. Uh, we pray that you will um, calm the winds and bring a little bit of warmth. And we just love going outside and being able to worship you in that stadium as well as our services here inside. Father, we pray that the message of a risen Savior conquering death would transform every life that hears it. Even those of us who have heard that message for decades, I pray that something would grip us about Jesus Christ conquering death by resurrection. And we pray that many will come to know you for the first time on Easter itself. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In these chapters, we noted last week that Paul is dealing with his own authority as an apostle. There was a group who had come in, a few individuals, probably it grew into a group of individuals who claimed to have authority, probably from Jerusalem, which we will see when we get into it. And they were able to influence the Corinthian church to the extent that Paul devoted a section of this letter to defending his call of God upon his life and his own apostolic authority. His authority as an apostle was different than their authority that they claimed to have in its character, in its nature. One was authority, that's Paul. The other was authoritarianism. And one seeks to serve people, to love people. That's authority. Biblical authority is, is when you realize God has put me in this position and he has called me to love people. Unbiblical authoritarianism doesn't seek to love people, but lord over people, to be in charge of people, to manipulate them, make them serve me. And it's really an act of, of arrogance and self-love. And Paul will, will, not be, will not be kind when he gets to these characters in this chapter. You'll get to a point where you go, ooh, he's taking the gloves off here. And he's just, he's just shooting straight with the Corinthian church because they, they were tolerating it. Having authority is a tricky calling because any type of authority is prone to abuse. And I would say especially in the church, especially Christian organizations, um, you know, because you can always say, well, the Lord called me and the Lord told me. And, and, and so people will just listen to that and buy into that without, well, I mean, I don't know if that's really right or not, and without checking it. And so we need to be those who discern. We need to learn to discern. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is the gift of the discerning of spirits. And it's a very needed gift uh, in the body of Christ. One of the things I've always loved and noted about Jesus in the Gospels is that though he had all authority in heaven and earth, he said, all authority has been given me in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28. And yet, though he was God the Son and had all authority, he didn't manipulate people with that authority. He didn't push people. He was very gentle. So there was Thomas who doubted Jesus. And when Jesus saw him 
after the resurrection and Thomas was in the room with the other apostles. He didn't say, Thomas, and call him out. Uh, you're such a jerk, Thomas. You're such a low life. After all the miracles you've seen me do, how could you? What's wrong with you? But it seemed that as an act of grace condescending to Thomas's level, he said, um, look, there's the wounds in my hands, my side, my feet. Put your hand and touch them. Make sure it's really me. When he knew, of course, he always knew, but when he said that somebody at the table, this table of, of the Passover, is going to betray me, he knew it was Judas. They didn't. Jesus could have easily said, boys, it's Judas. Nab him now. Take him out and give him a real thwacking upside the head. He didn't do that. He allowed Judas to make his own choice. He allowed Thomas to make his own choice. He had all authority, but he never exercised with an authoritarian platform. He let people make their own choices. At the same time, and this is where Paul comes into play here, at the same time, love must confront there comes a point when you allow people to make their own choices, but there comes a, a time and you, you say, well, what is that time? That's where the gift of discernment comes in. There comes a time when if you really love somebody, you will confront them. Jesus did confront authority, religious authority. He did call people out in the right context. Uh, he was unafraid when it came to the Pharisees in calling them whitewashed sepulchers. And so love will always um, let people make a choice, but at the right time, confront people. There was an occasion where Jesus looked over and his own apostles were having a conversation with the Pharisees. Jesus walked over to the Pharisees and publicly said, what are you talking to them about? He, he called them to a place of public accountability because they were talking to the disciples. So when you exercise authority and you sh let people make their own choices and show them love, there comes a point where you, you do say, okay, enough is enough. Stop right there. And it's not easy. In fact, the easiest thing to do is to avoid such conflict, avoid confrontation. And that's our tendency. Oh, let's just let them be. Let, let's avoid it. Okay, up to a point. But if you love God's flock, then you are going to call people out if their influence is going to hurt the body of Christ. And so we see both of those coming uh, to Jesus now or uh, exemplified by him. In the 20th chapter of the book of Acts, when Paul was meeting with the Ephesian elders, he was on his way to Jerusalem. He said, remember, I warned you day and night with tears that after my departure, savage wolves will come in, not sparing the flock. Remember, I told you, I warned you, they're seeking their own, they're after themselves. And he, he said that to the church at Ephesus. It was true there. It was also true in Corinth. It happened to be true in about every single church Paul started. Why is that? Well, Paul was a trailblazer. He was a church planter. And there are people like Paul who are trailblazers. They want to go where no man has gone before. They want to plant in an area where nobody has been and start a work and, and, and see something happen. I, I, I know that calling. I appreciate that and I identify with that. But then there are are other people who don't want to be trailblazers. They'd rather come into something already functioning, already existing, come into that and use that, which somebody else has done before them, for their own platform. They see it as an easy target. 
instead of evangelizing the lost, we mentioned this last time, they go in to evangelize the saved after their own ways. That's happening in Corinth. And so he continues here. Oh, verse 1, oh, that you would bear with me a little folly. And indeed, you do bear with me. It was awkward for Paul. It was somewhat embarrassing that he had to stoop to this level of needing to affirm, convince people of his apostolic authority. I mean, they should already be aware. Goodness, this is Paul the Apostle. This is a guy who was saved on the Damascus Road. Um, his credentials are the fruit in his life. His credentials are all of the churches he started around the world. But he stoops down to the level of the false teachers and those who are entertaining them when he says, Oh, that you would bear with me a little folly. Indeed, you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you. I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. Notice how it's worded. I'm not jealous about them. I'm not jealous um, about what they're doing and, 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 and their ministry. I'm not jealous for their ministry. I'm jealous for you, for you. And he said, with a godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I might present you a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul did picture himself as a spiritual dad, a spiritual father. Uh, he said, you have many teachers, but only one father. I have begotten you in the faith. So as a spiritual father, now he is using a metaphor that was very common in Judaism in that day and somewhat in certain places in this day, and that is there were stages of a relationship. First of all, in those days, marriages were not by individual choice. Marriages were arranged by parents. And I know everybody, every time you say that, people, oh, that's the worst thing in the world, having your mom and dad choose who your wife's going to be. I need to choose my own wife. I need to choose my own husband. Yes, you do, before the Lord. But I don't know that people making their own choices today uh, have a better track record in those choices than parents who made them in generations prior, given the divorce rate. So parents made the choice, and Paul sees himself as a father and the church of Corinth as a virgin bride, that he's going to walk down the aisle one day and give that bride away to a husband, and that is Christ. I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. I have betrothed or engaged you, promised you, to one husband, that I might present you a chaste virgin to Christ. Okay, there were three phases of a Jewish wedding. First was engagement, betrothal. Lasted about a year. It was legally binding. Documents were signed or a handshake was given. Uh, they'd have a sip of coffee to ratify the covenant. That's how they do it in the Middle East in many places to this day. And um, it was a binding oath. During the betrothal period that lasted a year, you were legally engaged to be married, legally married actually, though you couldn't enjoy the benefits of marriage in terms of a physical relationship. It was a year in which the bride and groom got to know each other. They were dating, although they were legally bound by contract. If you didn't like her and in that year period decided, I don't want to marry this chick, you had to go through legal divorce proceedings and have a certificate of divorce. That's how binding it was. So first phase was the betrothal. The second phase was the coming of the groom. On the wedding day, the groom came to the house of the bride, the parents uh, of the bride. She was still living at home. Uh, everybody was ready because the groom is coming today. The only thing is they didn't have text messages or emails or telephones. So you knew the groom was coming today, but that could be at any, at any time. You don't know exactly when. You always had to be ready. 
So you, you want to have the clothes ready. You want to have all the preparations done, makeup on, uh, lamps burning, because the bridegroom will come unannounced. He'll show up. Then, the third phase, a procession to the house of the groom, his parents' house, where there would be a formal ceremony, lots of joy, several days of feasting, including a marriage supper, and the couple would consummate their relationship. I love the picture. I love the metaphor. You and I are in phase one. We're engaged, betrothed to Jesus Christ. We're the bride. He's the bridegroom. He's coming for us, unannounced. Soon, he's coming. Until then, we're getting to know him. We're learning his word. We're in fellowship. We're learning things about him, about what the kingdom is going to be like. Soon, we're going to enter into phase two, where Jesus comes and literally literally sweeps us off our feet in the rapture of the church, takes us in the air with him. And then the marriage supper of the Lamb, together with him in his kingdom. Beautiful, beautiful picture. I remember my wedding day. What I remember is how stinking nervous I was. Nervous to the point of, I don't think I can go through with it. I said to uh, one of my grooms, I don't, I don't think I can do this. He, he said, you, 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 you're kidding, right? You can't even be talking like this or thinking like this. Skip it, your wedding day. Everybody's here. No, I can't do this. This is forever, man. This is a big commitment. Yeah. And I was just so nervous. Add to the fact that I'm in this crazy looking suit that I never would, who would wear one of these things? And the shoes... The shoes were like two and a half sizes too small for my feet, so I, my toes were curled up in this, these shoes. I was in pain, and I go grimacing out, standing there with the pastor who married us, and I was just nervous, and it was over 100 degrees. I was sweating. It was outside. Chip, you were there, I remember. And uh, then the bride showed up. When I saw her, when I saw Lenny in that bridal dress, it was just like, oh, no more anxiety, just pure joy. It just, she took my breath away. I have a feeling that when we see Jesus, no matter what struggle you've had in your life and how bad it's been, it's just like, gone. I'll take your breath away. So we're in phase one, waiting for phase two, on into phase three. And I love that. I've betrothed you, engaged you, promised you to one husband that I might present you a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Whoever these people were, whatever this group was, these false apostles that came in, they were taking something very simple and, and adding things to it to make it more complicated. This is what people do. We're really good at complicating something really simple. The gospel is the simplest thing in the world. Yes, there are complications. We're studying prophecy on the weekends. It can get quite... Um, you can go quite deep. But the gospel itself is simple. God sent his son into this world. God became a human being to suffer the ultimate death penalty, taking that penalty upon himself that we deserved in our place for our sins. Then, after 
dying, he was buried, and three days later, God raised him to life. He conquered death, showing that we could be forgiven, justified, and resurrected. It's that simple. It's, it's very simple. The problem is people want to complicate it. Oh, you need more than that, they say. You have to do more things than just believe, they want to tell you. It's Jesus and faith in him plus good works. It's faith in Jesus plus membership. It's Jesus plus. No, anytime you add to something very simple, you're actually robbing the power of the gospel. Why? Because you are telling God basically what Jesus did isn't sufficient. Wasn't enough. It's not enough for me to believe and trust that what he did is enough. So I have to add to it. I have to show you, God, prove to you, add to my salvation. So keep it simple. K-I-S-S. Keep it simple, saints. (laughs) Don't complicate what God made simple, the pure, easy, simple gospel. When you share with people, start there. Start there. Now, if they have objections, then bring in the apologetics. But start with the simple gospel. I, for years, would, in fact, we dated, my wife and I dated uh, doing this. We would go street evangelism, uh, street evangelism. We'd go out to the streets, go out to the Huntington Beach Pier, and we'd share the gospel with people. And, man, I was always ready because I knew the arguments that were coming. Or I knew the, the anger and the vitriol, so I was prepared and ready. But I learned after a while to just start with the simple facts of the gospel. And I was surprised how many people were ready to just hear it and receive it. Not everybody has a barrier, a boundary. Many do, but not everyone. So start with the simple gospel. They were adding to the simple gospel. And so I'm afraid that somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by craftiness, so your minds might be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. If someone who comes preaches another Jesus, another gospel, etc., These were the false apostles, the false prophets, whoever they were. But it's a significant thing happening in Corinth that he has to devote a few chapters to it. Around 100 AD, a book was written, legend has it, and we have a copy of it, uh, history says, called the Didache. The Didache, it's a Greek word for the teaching, the teaching of the apostles. And it was a little treatise on how to spot a true versus a false apostle. So evidently, this was a common thing that was happening. You had lots of itinerant traveling ministers, missionaries, and and it became so uh, problematic in the early church that this document had to be uh, written and circulated called the Didache. So, for example, uh, in that little booklet, it says, uh, if a missioner, an apostle, um, a missionary comes to you, uh, welcome him. In the name of the Lord, welcome him. Let him stay three days with you. If he stays more than three days, he's a false prophet. Because now he's trying to manipulate you, and he sees this as a way of life. And I can just sort of milk this congregation for weeks then move on to the next one. So they had strict parameters. Um, If if he comes in, welcome him, make him get a job. He should have honest employment. Welcome him, but test him to make sure his doctrine is pure. So it it was just a, a very pragmatic, practical treatise of how to spot a false prophet. Paul is worried. Why? Because... The church at Corinth invited him in, let him come in. Instead of saying, I don't, we don't know who you guys are. You claim to be apostles. You claim to be from Jerusalem. Get out of here. That's what they should have done. What happened is they tolerated them. You know, there is a t- 
tolerance that is not good. I know tolerance is supposed to be like the greatest virtue in 2023. Oh, you need to be tolerant of everybody. But people should not be tolerant of Christians for some reason. But you should be tolerant of everybody else. There is a tolerance that is not good. That's dangerous. 1 John chapter 4, beloved, test the spirits. Believe not every spirit, but test or try the spirits to see whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. So uh, if you're the skeptical type, good. It could be that you have the gift of discernment. Don't be afraid to use it. Don't be afraid to use it. The body of Christ needs um, the gift of discernment. You know, it's interesting, is it not, that Paul said the church is like a body, a human body. In your body, you have a liver. It filters out poisons. People that have the gift of discernment are sort of like the spiritual liver of the church. They're there to filter out the poison. Say, wait a minute, I think that guy something or that gal something's wrong. Oh, you're just, un you're a, always negative. Maybe. Or I have discernment. So don't be afraid to use it. And uh, in concert with other gifts, it's a beautiful, purifying, powerful gift. But he is chiding them that you, you have accepted it. And he said, if somebody comes with a different gospel, man, you'll put up with it. Now, do you remember? Paul wrote to the Galatians and said something similar. People are coming to you with a different gospel, which is not really the gospel. See, gospel means good news. When you add rules and regulations to the good news, it's no longer good news. It's bad news. Hey, have you heard the bad news? What is? Well, Jesus will save you, but you got to work hard to keep it, the whole, or you're, you're going to go to hell. There's no gospel there. And just as there are different gospels, by adding to the gospel, there are different Jesuses. Now, the Jesus of the New Testament is God. The God in human flesh. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were made through him. Without him was nothing made that has been made. Jesus is God. And the Word became flesh, dwelt among us. Incarnation. Just because somebody goes, well, I believe in Jesus. Ask them to define their terms. Define Jesus for me. Well, Jesus, you know, I believe in Jesus. No, tell me who Jesus is. Well, I think he was a good man. Ah, was he God? Well, no, different Jesus. You see, the Jesus of the Jehovah Witness organization is not the Jesus of the New Testament. The Jesus of the Jehovah Witness is not God, but the uh, archangel Michael. The Jesus of the, Jeho of the Jehovah Witnesses, Michael, the Jesus of the Mormon church is the spirit brother of Lucifer. Not the New Testament Jesus. So just because somebody goes, hey man, I believe in God, or God bless you, or uh, I believe in Jesus, or they get at some music award or acting award, and they get up to the microphone, I just want to thank God, and Jesus is awesome. And you go, oh wow, he's a Christian. Maybe. Maybe. You know, and I hear that, I go, hallelujah. But then, poke a little bit. Dig a little deeper. Get to the definition of Jesus. What meaning are they pouring into the words they are using? So, here's the thing with cultists. Same vocabulary, different dictionaries. Same vocabulary, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, heaven, hell, Get them to define the terms, you will suddenly find out, oh, there's different meanings, and it's not the meaning that I see in the New Testament. So um, Paul is saying, y you put up with it, you shouldn't. Verse 5, boy, I'm, I'm moving slow. For I consider that I, okay, so he said, look at 
bear with a little folly here. I'm going to go down to your level. For I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles, a better term, super apostles. I'm not less than those super apostles. Now, we don't exactly know who he's referring to when he says, I am, I, I am not any less than the most eminent apostles. A, he's talking about false apostles that came to the Corinthian church, called themselves like, oh, I'm really an apostle. I'm sent out by the Jerusalem church. I'm a super apostle. Or he is actually referring to the 12 apostles. And that could have been one of the accusations that, that this group was coming to the Corinthian church saying, Paul's not a real apostle. He wasn't one of the 12. He didn't hang out with Jesus from the beginning in his earthly ministry. Remember, there were certain qualifications that the 12 apostles, when Judas hung himself and they had to replace Judas's office, there were certain qualifications. A, he had to have been with us in the earthly ministry of Jesus going in and out among us from the beginning. And um, B, he had to be a witness of the resurrection. So we saw Jesus before and after the resurrection. In the 12th chapter of 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul will refer to the fact that the signs of an apostle were wrought by him, that he worked miracles. So that seems to have been another authenticating feature of one of the original apostles apostolic band is that they could perform some sort of miracle, healing, etc. So he said the works of an apostle were manifest in me. So I consider that I'm not inferior to the most eminent apostles. Even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Look, I lived with you for a year and a half, 18 months. I was there in Corinth. I worked among you. You saw me. Every, everything about my life was manifested. I was an open book. But there's, there's an interesting statement. If you don't mind, I just want to comment on it. When he says, even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. What Paul was referring to is that he was not a trained rhetorician. Corinth was in, a, in the region of Achaia, part of Greece, influenced by Athens. The Greeks put a huge, high premium on oratory, the ability to speak and communicate well, to hold an audience, to have a golden tongue for oration. They prized that. Paul was not trained in rhetorical speech. In fact, one of the accusations against Paul is, look, Paul writes heavy letters, awesome letters, fearful letters, but, you know, he's unimpressive when you hear him personally. We covered that last week. That's something Paul wrote. That was one of the accusations. What's interesting is Paul says, I might not be a trained rhetorician. I might not have a clever way of saying it, but when it comes to knowledge, I got that. He was trained rabbinically. He did have biblical knowledge, and he did have firsthand knowledge of Christ and saw how the Old Testament fit with the New. And he was persuasive. We noted last week that he persuaded the Jews at Damascus that Jesus is the Christ. Paul seems to place a higher premium on knowledge than on speech, on what you know more than how you say what you know. Today, I notice among many young preachers especially that how you say things is more important than what you know. If you just say it with enough you know, conviction and and. And, uh, and, and it becomes this giant pep rally. It's, it's all about style over substance. Doesn't matter what you know, it just matter if you can put on a show. It's the show, not the know. It's style over substance. Paul said, I don't have the style, but I got the substance. I got the knowledge. 
I, I have, I've got the truth. Did I commit, verse 7, did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied, and in everything I kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so I will keep myself. When Paul came to Corinth, he had a job. He was a skena kapias, or skena poyas, which means a tent maker. And that's what he did in Corinth. That's how he met Aquila and Priscilla, who also had that occupation. He met them in the synagogue. He formed a relationship. So living among them, he was determined that he would not take a salary from the Corinthian church, but actually he was salaried by the churches in Macedonia. If you remember the book of Philippians, he thanks the Philippian church in Philippians chapter 4, saying, for time and again, you did send aid for my necessities. And it has flourished again. Here you are again supporting me financially. Not that I seek the gift, but fruit that abounds to your account. So the churches in Macedonia, one of them was Philippi. Those churches supported Paul so that he could go into the region of Athens and Corinth, Achaia, that whole region, and share the gospel and not take a, any kind of a wage, though he was an apostle. And he did say in 1 Corinthians, those who preach the gospel should be able to live by the gospel. But he made it his personal ambition so that he could boast in this. I've robbed other churches. That is, I was supported by other churches, but I didn't take a dime from you. He was a tent maker. This, of course, became part of the accusation of the false apostles. Now, now, now listen to their reasoning. Well, Paul didn't take a dime from you guys. And all that means is Paul himself knows that he's not a true apostle. If he knew he was a true apostle, he would have let himself be remunerated. The fact that he didn't take money from you shows that he himself knows he's a fake. This is spin. This is how they were spinning it. And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied, and in everything I kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so I will keep myself. I am amazed at what people will put up with in churches. They'll put up with false doctrine. They'll put up with people yelling at them, berating them, um, soaking them, taking offering after offering after offering, um, and they'll, they'll put up with it. Uh, and, and I was, years ago, I was um, in Scotland. I went to a church. We were invited at a church. Uh, I brought a band with me in those days. We would play music, and, and often I would also share the gospel and do pastoral meetings, etc. And this one particular church we were invited to was headed up by an apostle, he called himself. Interesting. And uh, we did our ministry, and at the end, uh, he got up, and I listened to his pitch, his appeal. You know, these people have come all the way from America, and you need to dig deep and support them. And he passed the offering, and then he took the offering again. You need, you know, dig deeper and stuff. And I, I'm embarrassed. So I didn't know this was coming. But he was an apostle. And by apostolic authority, you know, he's taken this thing. So when it was all done, he made me come up in front of the crowd and he presented the offering for him. So I thanked him. And then I got the microphone. And I said to the crowd, I want to thank the apostles so much for this. And uh, we uh, feel that uh, you are probably supporting a uh, mission somewhere, and we want to give this money back to your missions fund. 
You know, we just thought, I'm not going to touch that money with a 10-foot pole. Uh, and so we, did, we gave it back to their mission fund for them to support people who are, are sharing the gospel. Like Paul, they can do it free of charge. So Paul said, I've kept myself a burden, and so I will keep myself. As the truth, verse 10, as the truth of Christ in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows. In other words, God forbid, of course I love you. This is why I'm doing it. God knows. But what I do, I will also continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. They call themselves an apostle. I'm not going to let them have that boast. For such, verse 13, now, this is where he takes the gloves off. Here's the bare-fisted punch. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers. This is where the gift of discernment kicks in. Deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Yeah, wow, he's just, uh, you know, pulling no punches, just bam, false prophet, false apostle, deceitful worker. Now, Paul is coming there, remember. He hasn't come yet. He hasn't come back yet. He's coming. And uh, he says, you know, get all this stuff squared away. I'm coming. And if they don't think uh, that, that I'm going to, that, that I'm meek and mild in person, just wait. I'll be there. They're false uh, apostles. I've got a, my mark set on them. Got the bullseye on them. I know who they are. When somebody false comes into the church, they don't come saying, hi, I'm your neighborhood cultist. I'm your local neighborhood false prophet. I'd like to deceive you if I could have five, ten minutes of your time, please. No, they come like Little Red Riding Hood to Grandma's house. And they wear the mask. And they're underneath a wolf in sheep's clothing. So Paul is pulling off the mask. Just in case you think that this is, well, this is antiquated. This stuff doesn't happen. It has always happened throughout church history. Do you recognize how often Old and New Testament, this was a huge deal? Do you realize in the law itself, in Deuteronomy 13, there's a whole chapter devoted to people who speak the name of the Lord, do miracles in the name of the Lord, but are false prophets and how to discern them? That's in the law. Do you realize in the prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they talk about false shepherds and uh, people who poison the flock and God didn't send them and how to spot them? Uh, all the way into the New Testament, Jesus warned of them, John warned of them, Peter warned of them, and Paul did as well. All the way to the end of time, Revelation 13, the Antichrist is accompanied by, what's his name? The false prophet. The false prophet. There will be some personage at the end of time in cahoots with the man of sin or the son of perdition or the Antichrist, whatever you want to call him, the little horn of Daniel 7. The false prophet will help him carry out his agenda. And so they've always been around. And by the way, you don't have to look for them. They'll come to you. Jesus said, for they will come to you. And they will. They come to every assembly. I know you're going, hmm. Well, who are they? They'll come to you, but you'll spot them. I've told you before when I had a little Bible study in Garden Grove, California, every Tuesday night. It was in a living room, and I remember it was growing, and the living room was packed, and one Tuesday night, 
this guy I had never seen before showed up. And his eye was on this beautiful girl across the room. And he had his Bible open, but he's kind of looking her way. And, and just went over to her after the study and said, the Lord told me during this Bible study, during Skip's study, that you're going to be my wife. And she held up her uh, left finger, hand. She had a ring on it. She said, I'm married. And that would deter most people, right? right? This is a stop sign for a lot of guys like that. But he said, well, obviously you married the wrong person. And it wasn't the will of God. I am the will of God. Well, she was, she didn't know what to say. She never heard that kind of a, I mean, there's guys with clever lines when they want to pick up a girl, but that was a new one. So she came and found me and I, told me what was going on. And this was, an, this was an easy fix for me. I just grabbed him by the arm, walked him outside, said, wherever you walk from or a car, get in it, go, never come back. Get out of here conversation over they should have done that with these people in Corinth they didn't have enough discernment to do that so they'll come to you I say again verse 16 let's see how we do here I say again let no one think me a fool if otherwise at least receive me as a fool that I also may boast a little bit so they were talking about you know, they believed in the wisdom, the Sophia of the ages, the, the wise teaching that comes from Athens, etc. And Paul is, you know, he's not as uh, savvy. He's more of a fool. And so Paul says, okay, uh, indulge my foolishness because I'm not done boasting yet. If otherwise, at least receive me as a fool that I also may boast a little. What I speak, I speak not according to the Lord, but as it were, foolishly in this confidence of boasting. Now, don't misunderstand that. He's not saying, okay, I'm going to say a few words now that aren't inspired. I'm going to get in the flesh. No, I think what he's saying by this when he says, uh, I speak not according to the Lord, but as it were, foolishly. You know, Jesus made very straightforward claims about who he was. And he was not received. Paul is making straightforward claims and he's not being received, so he's taking a different approach, like an awkward, embarrassing fool to go out of his way to prove that he is an apostle. I think that's the idea behind that verse. For verse 19, you put up with fools gladly, since you yourselves are wise. This is called sarcasm. For you put up with it if one brings you into bondage, if one devours you, if one takes from you, if one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face. Now, I, this is going to sound really weird to you, but 2,000 years ago, teachers, people in charge, in formal school settings, if their students weren't paying attention, or didn't answer correctly, the teacher would slap the student across the face. Now, you get sued if you did that today. Although I will tell you, when I went to elementary school, I got spanked by my teacher. I'm not opposed to bringing that back, but I'll get into trouble for saying that, so I never said that. Um, <laughs> but in those days, you could get slapped by a teacher upside the face. Paul did. When Paul stood before the Sanhedrin in Acts 23, he said, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And when he said that, the high priest commanded those standing next to Paul, slap him on the face for saying that. And Paul said, God will smite you, you whitewashed wall. And the people standing next to Paul said, oh, you the Bible says you shouldn't revile the high priest. And Paul said, well, I didn't know it was the high priest. Now, how Paul didn't know it was the high priest is the subject of a whole other Bible study. So, but he got slapped upside the face. So, so, 
This is why in Titus chapter 1, when Paul gives the qualifications of pastoral ministry, he says, not a violent man, literally not a striker. Not somebody who slaps their student upside the head for giving the wrong answer. So let him be a servant, an encourager. So you, you put up with it if, if somebody does that to you, even strikes you on the face. To our shame, verse 21, I say, uh, we were too weak for that. But in whatever anyone is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they of the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundantly, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they sons of Abraham? So am I. What is he talking about? It seems the false prophets claim to be apostles sent out from the church in Jerusalem. And they probably even carried letters of recommendation. He refers to this in chapter 3. Do we need letters of recommendation to you or from you? You are our letter, right? Not, we don't need letters of recommendation. Apparently, these false apostles were Jewish. We're adding legalistic restrictions onto the Corinthian believers in that town. On, well, we're Hebrews. We're sons of Abraham. We're from the Jerusalem church. Paul says, so am I. And then says, let me give you my real credentials. In labors, more abundant stripes above measure, prisons more frequently, in deaths often. Now, <laughs> he's going to list his sufferings. As you read through these, here's what I want you to keep in mind. We have just a few minutes and we're closing with this. Much of what you read in this list is not recorded in the book of Acts. So when you read the book of Acts, if you think, oh, that's all that Paul suffered, no. He now fills in the rest of the story, at least part of the rest of the story. So he is filling in some of the blanks. Some of these incidences are not recorded in the book of Acts. So Paul, long story short, suffered a lot. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, minus one. In Deuteronomy 25, the law stipulated if you are brought before a judge and found guilty, of certain kind of crimes, you could be beaten up to 40 times, like sm smitten, flogged, 40 lashes. The Jews made a practice of doing it 39, not 40. Probably so they wouldn't miscount, like if they didn't count right and they would give one too many and they would go against the Bible. So just do 39 and it, that was considered an act of mercy. Well, we'll just do it. We'll, we'll beat you 39 times because we love you. Is it, we want to be merciful and show grace, so turn around. 40 strikes minus one. Happened five times to him. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Of course, you know that doesn't mean... Uh, um, Anything other than rocks were thrown at him. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I spent in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. It's a lot of perils. It's a string of perils. In weariness, in toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside the other things which come upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. You want to know my credentials? 
Paul is saying, my credentials, you know, they say, we're super apostles. We'll come in and we'll slap you upside the head and take money from you. And Paul, he's not a real apostle. You know, he didn't take money from you because he's no, he's not a real apostle. And Paul said, I'll show you my credentials. This is how I've suffered. Not just those physical sufferings, but the things that come upon me daily. Deep concern for all the churches. Think of all the heartache in Paul's ministry. He goes to Ephesus. He's starting a work there. Somebody comes from Corinth and says, Church in Corinth, man, they're in a bad way. There's divisions, adultery, incest, weirdness. Okay, I'll write a letter. I mean, you know, I mean, just, just to maintain that was a daily burden. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to stumble? And I do not burn with indignation. Look, I'm human too. I suffer too. I have feelings as well. I, I'm weak. If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. We'll get to that next week. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. And interesting here, after listing all of the perils, he ends the list with how he began his ministry. He began his ministry in Damascus, and he ends this list with, verse 32, in Damascus, the governor under Eratos, the king was guarding the city of the Damascenes of the Damascus people with a garrison desiring to arrest me, but I was let down in a basket. A very inglorious exit from Damascus. The basket was a wicker garbage basket. So here's the great apostle Paul. Put him in a garbage can. Get him over the wall. I was led down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. So Paul's ending credentials. Warren Wiersbe used to say, when you look for a leader, look for scars. When we look for leaders, well, what seminary did you go to? And, and what experience have you had? And how important are you? And, and what degrees do you have behind your name? Paul would say, you want to see my credentials? Look at this scar and this scar and this scar. One of my favorite poems is by Amy Carmichael, a missionary. Hast thou no scar? No hidden scar on foot or side or hand. I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascendant star. Hast thou no scar? Hast thou no wound? Yet I was wounded by the archers spent. Lean me against the tree to die and rent. By ravenous wolves that encompass me, I swooned. Hast thou no wound? No wound, no scar, yet as the master shall the servant be, and pierced are the feet that follow me, but thine are whole. Can he have followed far who has no wound or scar? As a follower of Jesus Christ, you are given a promise. In this world, you will suffer persecution. If you are his and you proclaim the faithful gospel and live rightly, you will not be loved by everybody. The quicker you come to grips with that, the more joyful you will become. So that when the scar comes, you go, hallelujah. Another scar, another wound. For the glory of God. Paul marched through, loving the Corinthians, suffering for Christ. And next week, he continues his boasting in his infirmities, a present condition that he was experiencing. We'll try to discover what it was and how it happened. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. 
Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.